Rock and Roll Geek Show 682. Still rocking after all these years. This is the story of my rock and roll butler. This is it, the show that started it all. Often imitated, but never equal. From San Francisco, USA, online since 2004, it's the one and only Rock and Roll Geek Show. With the original Rock and Roll Geek, Michael Butler. Welcome to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. My name's Michael Butler. Thanks a lot for joining me. <clears throat> I really appreciate it. Today is Tuesday, February 2nd, 2016, and it is 6.15 p.m. when I'm recording this show. This is take two. The first one was just a complete mess, and let's hope this, that the second one is not as much of a mess. But uh, we're not getting off to a great start. I'm taking a sip of this fine Tecate. I'm almost done with my first Tecate of the day, so let me finish it up. Ah, it was like a little tiny little bit of mouth uh, backwash in there. Not even enough to ah. So the last two shows have been track by track reviews. Uh, last week I did Megadeth, Dystopia. The week before that I did the new Paul Westerberg, Juliana Hatfield uh, record, which was the I Don't Care's Wild Stab. Both albums I did gave pretty good reviews, I think. Well, tonight I have a lot of audio comments I'm gonna I'm gonna play for you. Got some music I want to play for you and some other things I want to get to as well. This has been uh, backing up. And later on this week, I'm going to do an, uh, well, if I have time, I'm going to do another track by track of the new Whitford St. Holmes, which I just got, which I cannot wait to play it for you, friends. I might play one song tonight. Played a little bit on last night's Mad at Dad. What are we going to start off? What we, be, we being me, what I'm going to start off with tonight is something I also played on Mad at Dad a little bit last night. Way Mad at Dad works, I usually fade in from a song. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm choking on this fine Tecate. I think I need to open one now to clear my throat here. This is bad. It's very bad. I'm not going to do a take three. I'm just going to power through it, friends. Ah! <coughs> All right, I'm going to play some music. I'm going to clear my throat. This is brand new CJ Wildheart. I got this album on Pledge Music along with the Robot Hot Sauce, which is over here on my shelf. The bottle looks so cool. Let me pull it down here. The bottle looks so cool, I almost don't want to open it. Because I know I'm going to love, but I know I'm going to love the hot sauce. I don't want to open it, though, because it looks, the bottle, the hot sauce, very nice packaging. But it looks really delicious, so I'm going to have to open it. I'm not going to just sit it on my shelf. I opened the Joe Perry, finished that. A long time ago, so I'm gonna do the same with the joke with the with the CJ robot hot sauce. Chris Stanley, I think Chris Stanley sent me this album as well, but I had already bought it on Pledge Music. I played a little bit of this show on last night's Mad at Dad. Like I was getting ready to say, usually at the beginning of Mad at Dad, it fades in halfway through the end of a song. Well, the song that it faded into, which I didn't give credit for, which was this song from CJ Wildheart. The album's called Robot. Here's no rhyme or read. Dead all 
There you go. Brand new C.J. Wildhart. Uh, no rhyme or reason. The record's called Robot. All right. Let's thank some people who donated. And let me find some music to play in the background. I'm, I'm brand new Paul Gilbert. I think this is brand new. I just got it. It is called I Can Destroy. It's the name of the album. I'll just, find, I'll just get to the first song on it. This, this is called... Hold on a second. This is called Everybody Use Your Goddamn Turn Signal. All right. Paul Gilbert. <laughs> There's two, several ways you can donate to the show. One is through Patreon, patreon.com slash rnrgeek. Use your eyes. Look Listen to Paul Gilbert a second here. I just now put everybody it on the computer. Use your ears. <laughs> Listen to me when I say now. Everybody use your goddamn turn signal. Hi. Thank you to Eric Stoll. He donated from on Patreon five dollars per episode. Thank you, Eric Stoll. I really appreciate it, friends. Turn signal. Thank you to my good friend Chiaki from the Metal Woman podcast. Came over last Friday. We had a big, huge salmon feast and some food on the grill. He brought over some big, huge shrimp and some oysters. I made some ramen soup. We had a Japanese dinner, and it was pretty, pretty good. Salmon sashimi. Thank you to Brian Springer, who donates $5 an episode on Patreon. Thank you to Matthew Hunt for the $5 an episode on Patreon. Patreon. Patreon.com slash RNRG. Thank you to my podcast mentor and co-host of the Mad at Dad podcast, Dave Slusher, for the $5 on Patreon. Thank you to Robert Harvey for the $2. Thank you to Corey Kohler for $1 per episode on Patreon. You can also donate on Patreon. This is not too bad. I'm not, I don't know much about Paul Gilbert, but I'm, except that he's a shredder. Isn't he in Mr. Big? Everybody use your goddamn... Use your goddamn turn signal! You can also donate on Patreon, or on, excuse me, on Pat, PayPal. <laughs> There's links on, rock, on the show notes at rockandrollgeek.com. Dan McBride... For the five dollars, thank you to Paul Underwood for the ten dollars. Thank you to John Boveri for the five dollars. Thank you to Peter Spark for the two dollars. Thanks to a friend of mine, Michael Mack, for the two dollars. Thank you to Patrick Shanahan for the twenty dollars. Thanks, Patrick Shanahan. Thank you for this fine tecate to you, friend. Thank you to Chris Harrison for the ten dollars. Thank you to Mario Zoth for the two dollars. Thank you to Paul Fondery for the $10. Thank you to David Ivey for the $5. Thank you to Jeff Thielenlicky for the $10. Thank you to Adrian Boshin, Bosch Rock on the forums and at Rock and, Rock and Roll Geek Facebook page. Grab a hold of that wheel. Everybody press on the gas. Till your back tires peel now. Everybody use your goddamn, goddamn. I forgot where I am. Thank you to Keenan O'Meara for the five dollars. Use your goddamn turn signal. All right. Thank you to Dave Franco for the ten dollars. Thank you to Greg Long for the five dollars. Thank you to Thank you to James Venters for the ten dollars. Thank you to Dean Gillespie for the five dollars. Thank you to Richard Strom for the five dollars. Everybody use your mind. Everybody use your goddamn turn signal. All right, let's let it play. Our next song is I Can Destroy. Thank you to, I forget where I am, so I'm going to start at Dale Roller. Thank you to Dale Roller for the $5. Thank you to Andrew Howell for the $5. Thank you to Jer O'Carroll for the $5. Thank you to Jason Shepard for the $10. 
Thank you to Todd Cunningham for the $10. Thank you to Lassie Sattvighagen for the $2. Thank you to Jeffrey Canaparoli for the $2. Thank you to Stephen Mascord for the $5. Thank you to John Skiller for the $2. Thank you to Bradley Lisco, BJ Lisco for the ten dollars. Not too bad. Kind of like this for a shredder. Thank you to friend of mine and friend of the show, Todd Cunningham, for the ten dollars. Thank you to Lassie Sattvighagen for the $2. Thank you to Jeffrey Canaparoli for the $2. Thank you to Stephen Mascord for the $5. Thanks to John Skiller for the $2. Oh, wait a minute. I'm repeating people, I think. Thanks to Bradley Lisco for the $10. Thanks to Michael Valoya for the $2. Thank you to Ralph Miller for the $10. Thanks to Tim Smith for $10. Thank you to Anthony Moscalzo for the $2. Thanks to Bradford Page for the $2. Did I thank Jer O'Carroll for the $5? Thank you, Jer O'Carroll. Thank you to Sigmund Hydaster for the $5. Thanks to School of Podcasts and Dave Jackson for the $10. Thanks to Chris Stanley for the $10. And thank you to Michael Stevens for the $10. I take a sip of this fine Tecate to everybody. Who, without your donations, friends, this show would die a horrible, stench-filled, putrid, dog-vomiting, shit on the bottom of your shoes, horrible death. I take a sip of this fine Tecate to you, friends. Ah. All right. All right. Kill the Paul Gilbert. Okay. I like that, Paul Gilbert. He's a shredder. That record is called I Can Destroy. All right, we got some we got some audio comments. Where can I what should I start? How about right here? Hey Michael, this is uh JB. Uh oh, I got a spinning beach ball. Hey JB. You gotta wait till my computer. And, okay. Um actually was gonna call in. Um I don't have any show reviews because I haven't been to a show in a while, although okay. I am gonna go see A C D C when they play here. I had to pay a lot for the ticket, but I just, I've never seen before and I need to see him because I'm sure this is going to be their last go around. So I wanted to make sure I got it. Uh, I was listening to one of your podcasts. This is a little outdated for me, but um, it took me a while to get a chance to leave you an audio comment. But well, I appreciate it, friend. I was listening to one of your podcasts and just thinking about how happy the rock and roll geek must be that Cheap Trick had made it into the Rock and That's Roll Hall right. of Fame. When I got the news, started receiving text that Lemmy had passed, and that was just crushing. And it was so crushing because Motorhead should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and of course, I'm surprised they they're not. They will it, be. They he's will not be. Be there for it, which just shows how much the Rock and Roll yeah, Hall of Fame can exactly. suck. Exactly. They they will get in, but Lemmy will get it posthumously. Anyway, having said that. I came up with, and I actually saw an article here, and I thought it would be a good uh, thing to run by you. I saw an article called The Biggest Snubs to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Okay. And I thought, you know who I'd like to get their comments on this? It would be the rock and roll geek himself, Michael Butler. So what I thought I'd do is I'm going to run through this list here. Okay. And after each name... How much you want to bet Ted Nugent's not on that list? But go ahead, go ahead. You feel free to pause okay. and give me your thoughts. Should or shouldn't they be in the okay. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? And maybe it. if you want, uh, play a favorite track or two by any of these artists uh, that you think uh, best represents whether they should or shouldn't. I might be not in have the them on my computer, but I will look. And, my iTunes um, crashed. I'm not even going to mention the name Motorhead because I think everyone should agree that they should be in. It's ridiculous. Yeah, they not. will. But be. Let me run these names by you. Sticks. Uh, hold on. Let me stop here. Stop. I actually think Sticks should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They've been around since like 72. They wrote, they had a lot of hits. When I was a kid, those guys owned Arena Rock. They were the Arena Rock band. 
rock radio was sticks pieces of eight in the 70s. Tons of hits. You go watch them in concert. Every song they play is a massive hit. So love them or hate them, yes, I think Sticks absolutely deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Next one. Judas Priest. Of course. Absolutely. Without after, Come on. Black Sabbath is in there. What other metal band is more metal than Black Sabbath? Judas Priest. Of course. Billy Idol. Uh, yeah, I think Billy Idol probably did. I mean, so, judging by some of the people who are in there now, I think Billy Idol's had enough hits where he can. He probably deserves to be in there. He probably will eventually get in there, I, I think. Yeah, I kind of think he does. If the cars deserve to be in, Billy Idol does. Phil Collins. Is he not in the... I thought he was already in there with Genesis. Solo? Fuck that. No way. He deserves to be in with Genesis, but no. <laughs> but he did have a lot of hits, but I just don't like Phil Collins' music. I mean, if you've already been in there with one band, why do you need to go in there solo, too? I mean, that's isn't that kind of greedy? That's my opinion. Stevie Nicks. I think that she's in with Fleetwood Mac. Then she doesn't need to be in solo. She's she's fine. Fleetwood Mac's in. She's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Why put her in twice? It's stupid. But uh, in as a solo artist. Also, I'm going to withhold all my uh, opinions and comments. I'm going to leave this all up to you and let you. Uh, I bet you agree. You I bet fit. you agree. All right, next. Kansas. Ah, oh, come on. They got one song, Dust in the Wind, and that song sucks ass. No, absolutely not. Kansas does not deserve to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at all. I saw them open for a lot of bands. I think I saw them open for Bad Company on the Running with the Pack tour or some one of those around that time. They were so boring. No, Kansas, absolutely not. They got, they're a one-hit wonder, and it's Dust in the Wind. Name another Kansas song. I don't know of it. Rock and roll geek at gmail.com with your hate mail. Free. Wait a minute. What now? What? Uh, what? Did you say free? Kansas. Okay, I already said that one. Free. Uh, free. Pr- probably. Probably so. Is Bad Company already in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Because Paul uh, Rogers definitely deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, at least with free. So, yeah, I guess they probably do. Not a huge free fan, but yeah, I think they probably do. Thin Lizzy. <laughs> what do you think I'm going to say? Of course, they will probably never be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But I said Cheap Trick, not even, not even uh, considered. So behind the scenes, maybe they will. But yeah, I think, I think Thin Lizzy deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Not a bunch of hits, but very influential and just a great band just because I love them so much. Just p- my personal feelings, I would like them to be in because I love them so much. Joe Walsh. I love Joe Walsh. I think he does deserve to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's in there with the Eagles, right? So... I mean, sticking by my guns, he's already in there with the Eagles. Why does he need to be in again? He's already in there. If he, if his name is in the Rock and Roll of Fame, I got, got to stick to my guns. Although he was a successful solo artist before he was in the Eagles, but if he's in there with the Eagles, he's already in. Joe Walsh is, uh, he's in there with the Eagles, That's I guess, but I uh, maybe he's go. a solo artist. Or is with the James Gang, I guess. <clears throat> yes. Absolutely, yes, deserves to be in the Rock and Roll, rock, rock and roll Hall of Fame. They pretty, like I've said before, they pretty much invented progressive rock, didn't they? If Rush is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, why isn't yes? Yes, they do. And they will be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They'll get in. How about the Moody Blues? <laughs> yeah, I don't like the Moody Blues, but everybody says they deserve to be in, and they will get in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, yes. What about Electric Light Orchestra? Aren't they in there already? I thought they were already in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. If they're not, yeah, I think they probably do deserve to be in. Some of the crappy bands that are in there, they deserve to be in there. I like Electric Light Orchestra, though. All that new album is horrible. How about Bad Company? Yes, Bad Company deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. How about Butler Who Should 
Journey be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Uh, yeah, I think they probably, they have enough hits. Why not? I mean, some of the people that are in there, yeah, Journey deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Why not? What about the cars? Should they be in? Yeah, I already said that. I already said the cars. Def Leppard. That one's a shock to me. I'm surprised mm. they're not in yet. Uh, they w- they deserve to eventually be in the Rock and Roll of Fame. Yeah, I think they deserve to be in. A lot of hits, sure. Jethro Tull. Yes, absolutely. Jo- Aqualung. Come on. I'm telling you, Aqualung does not doesn't get the credit for being a great rock album that it deserves and i'm still going to pull a classic albums revisited out of my ass with aqualone because that album is great top to bottom i'm telling you friends yes i think jethro Tull deserves to be in they probably would not get in because they don't have rock credibility because of the grammy heavy metal nomination they're now have that joke over their shoulders so it's going to be a long time before jethro Tull gets in but i think they deserve to be in oh, cocker Joe Cocker, he's not in? I thought he, thought he was already in. So, I, I, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I thought all those Woodstock guys were in, so why not him? Not a huge fan. Pardon me, on bourbon, it was fine to cut. I'm not a huge fan, but, uh, excuse me, I guess he deserves to be in. Although, I don't know how many hits he's had, and he doesn't have any originals. So, I almost think he doesn't deserve to be in, but he's dead now. So, speak, oh, speaking of dead, if I can interrupt you... The audio comment. Uh, Matt at Dad on Dave Slusher and I have the Rock and Roll Death Pool. Music, musicians Death Pool. And I don't know if Joe Cocker is in there or not, but we have one more week before the sign-ups are... are um, before you cannot sign up anymore. So if you want to be in, the, in our... If you want to take part in the Musician's Death Pool, go to mattatdadpodcast.com slash deathpool. All right, Matt at Dad's podcast.com slash death pool if you want to get in. Last chance, friends. We got about 25 people in there, so we could use some more. All right, uh, where am I here? Okay, back to you. Michael Butler should foreigner be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> million hits, million hits. Every album they put out was a massive hit, so yes, they do. Pat Benatar. Uh... Mm, she, very influential. She influenced a lot of fashion. All the girls wanted to be Pat Benatar when they were kids, and so yeah, I think so. Her, if if it's going to be Pat Benatar, it needs to be her and Neil Giraldo, though. He deserves to be in as much as her because he was the brains behind the Pat Benatar. So yeah, I guess so. The Doobie Brothers. <sighs> They're not in there already. I thought they were in there, but yeah, I guess so. All these all these people pretty much deserve to be in there. Come on, but before Run D, before uh, Chic, or or uh, who's the the rap band that got it that's getting in this time? Uh, straight out of Compton, guy, whatever they're called. I don't know rap. You know who I'm talking about? Yeah, I think they. I think Doobie Brothers probably do before them. Peter Frampton. Uh, biggest selling live album of all time. Yeah. Although is Humble Pie in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Because he was in Humble Pie. So if he's already in with Humble Pie, he doesn't need to be in solo. But if he's not, if Humble Pie is not in, which they should be, then he should be in. Is Mott the Hoople in? Did he get in with them? I don't know if they're in. What about Boston? Should Boston? Uh, well, Peter Frampton wasn't in Mott the Hoople, um, uh, but um, he was in Humble Pie. But yeah, Does, should, did he say Boston? Well, I'm three minutes fifty. I forget who's this audio comment is. Let me see who it is again. So. Hey, Michael, this is uh, JB. JB, okay, that's what I thought, okay. Okay, where am I here? I've lost my place. Back it up here. I'm sorry for the unprofessionalism. Pat Benatar. Okay, I've already gone through that. Let me skip it ahead here. Your brothers. All right, skip it ahead here, skip it ahead here, skip it ahead here. Is Mott the Hoople in? Did he get in with them? I don't know if they're no, in. Peter Frampton. I don't know if Mott was Boston? in. Boston? Should Boston be in? Uh, they will probably never give it, get in because they are too AOR radio. So they probably, the the snobs at in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame are probably too snobby to put Boston in. Rest in peace, Brad Delp. Killed himself with a barbecue grill in his bathroom. It, I guess they, they probably deserve, deserve All those albums were huge. What about Dire Straits? 
<sighs> dire Straits be in there? Now you're just getting mean. Uh, the final one no, on this list. I don't think Dire Straits deserves to be in there. The Grand Funk Railroad. Absolutely. Grand Funk Railroad deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Was I a fan? Not really, but they deserve to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Grand Funk Railroad be in. And then I threw, I jotted down a couple other names new to them. I'm surprised they weren't in this article that I saw. Um, Brian Adams. Should Brian Adams be in? Brian Adams, um, um, he probably Motley won't Crue. be. Should Motley hold Crue on, be Hold on, hold on, hold on. Brian Adams, I, I would vote for him to be in, but I don't know if he's going to be in for a while. Motley Crue will eventually get in the Rock World Hall of Fame. I'm laughing because Adam Curry said, fuck you, Butler, on that Facebook. <laughs> There's this picture of Adam Curry holding his girlfriend up. And he looks like he's struggling to hold her up. <laughs> and I said, looks like you're struggling to hold her up. And he says, fuck you, Butler. All right. And uh, final one. This is one I've seen thrown out there, too. I'm not sure I would buy this, that they should be in there. But I've seen the name Night Ranger mentioned, too. No! Uh, absolutely so anyway, not! Absolutely not! Just want to see what your Night thoughts were, Ranger. Michael, on all those as we enter this uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame season. And we always talk about which ones are snubs. And I wanted to know what Michael Butler thought of each of those. And I also wanted to hear some, a favorite track he had for each one of those artists, if oh. possible. Oh, wow. Yeah, anyway, we have to go back. hope you're doing well. Stay frosty, my okay, friend. Okay, let me think about this now. Let me just think. Uh, favorite track from favorite track from Brian Adams is the. Um, oh, that's going to take a long time, uh, JB. A long time. We're already twenty eight minutes into this. I. That's something I need to revisit. I'm going to hold on to your audio comment, JB. Send me a reminder that we can do a, my favorite track from all these people who are who have been snubbed from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and maybe I will do a episode devoted to your audio comment all right uh, where are we here that was a long audio comment that was no it wasn't long i just made it long it was only a five minute audio comment i dragged it out for a fucking long time i want to play a song now should i get to a song what do i have in the list here in my playlist uh you want to hear a new Whitford St. Holmes? All right. I'm going to do a track-by-track track of new Whitford St. Holmes on the next episode, but I'm going to give you a little teaser. I've been looking forward to this album for so long. Billy Rowe got it for me at NAMM because Derek St. Holmes and, and Brad Whitford came to his booth, Rock and, Roll Relics, Rock and Roll Relics guitar booth, and he gave me the CD, and I cannot wait to play the entire thing for you, friends, but I'm going to play one song for you now. This song is called Rock All Day from Whitford St. Holmes. Brand new album's called Reunion, by the way. We rock all day. And I have the spinning beach ball of death, and I'm getting ready to smash my computer. Oh, okay. All right. Start. Take two. Rock all day. Whitford St. Holmes. <laughs>
There you go. Brand new Whitford St. Holmes. You can only buy that at their shows. The record's called Reunion. I'm going to do a track by track on the next Rock and Roll Geek episode. I have not listened to it. I've listened to it once all the way through, and I need to listen to it a lot more. But my first impression is pretty good. So if you go to it, if, if Whitford St. Holmes comes to your town, go there and buy the album. I'm, but if you can't, if they're not coming to your town, which is a good chance that they're not, listen to the next Rock and Roll Geek show because so, we will listen to the whole album together, friends. All right, another audio comment. Last time I did a regular Rock and Roll Geek show, pardon me on bourbon, it was fine, Tecate. Ugh. Oh, that's gross. Uh, Tim, I think Tim Smith, the rock and roll runner, uh, said he, he did a call out, a call to action for all of the, any girl rock and roll geek listeners to call in and leave a comment. So uh, here you go. Hey, Michael Butler. This is Eileen Parent, and I heard Tim Smith say girls don't listen to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. Well, I'm a girl, and I'm listening to the Rock and Roll Geek Show right now, and I'm wearing my Rock and Roll Geek t-shirt that Santa brought me. And I'm drinking a fine Tecate to you, my friend. There you Stay go. Stay frosty, Michael Butler. All right. There you go, huh? All right. There you go. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Eileen. <laughs> All right. <sighs> All right, another audio comment. What we got here? Okay, here we go. Hello, Michael Butler. How are you doing? I'm super great. Couldn't be better. Really? <laughs> All right, this is Eric, the Rock and Roll Plebe. Hey, Rock and Roll short, Plebe. Uh, book review. Um, but first, a toast. I would like to take a, a book sip review. of this fine Ito in Oi Ocha green tea. Okay. <sighs> ah. I'll, I'll chase it with a fine Tecate. All right, so this is a quick book review of ah! Van Halen Rising. Van Alice Halen Su- Rising, the book that is, uh, I think it's published by Matt Severson, the guy who's gonna, who is supposed to be helping me with the Rock and Roll Geek biography um, that I'm way behind on. Hopefully he's still going to want to help me with it if I ever get the thing written. Southern California backyard party band saved heavy metal. I'll re- I mean, right, right. Start that. How a Southern California backyard party band saved heavy metal by Greg Renoff. Um, it's pretty good. Um, there's 13 chapters. It's pretty good. Um, I, if I was to use the rock and roll geek uh, scoring method. I have not read it yet. He sent me the uh, PDF, the ebook of it. So I would like a hard copy. It would probably be a 10 out of 13. It's, so 10 of the chapters good. are good. It's um, the history of the band from their beginnings all the way through right around the time of the making of the second album. Um, there are some chapters here and there that, you know, it gets a little bit redundant where it just talks about them playing, you know, this part, this place or this other place and 
It's a little bit slow at points, and there's no, um, you know, dirty sex and drug kind of stories in there, but it's a really good kind of overview of the It's ba- written from a fan's point of view, right, um, Plebe? And um, I'd recommend it to any rock fan. Um, you know, good stories on where, uh, you know, the idea for two-handed tapping came from and talks about, you know, the band forming, of course, and troubles with David Lee Roth in the beginning and um, troubles getting signed and you're talking about uh, what's his name Gene Simmons <laughs> yeah um, have any interest in the band and recording the demo so uh, it, it's a pretty good uh, history of the band during that beginning time period and I, I probably would recommend it to any uh, Van Halen fan or uh, rock fan in general it's around 300 some pages pretty easy read I mean I I read it over a course of a month. I'm a slow reader. <laughs> yeah, but, me too, friend. Um, it's, it's not that, you know, no really big words or anything. But, oh, good. And, Thank uh, God. It's a good book. So 10 out of 13, I'd recommend uh, Van Halen Rising, How a Southern California Backyard Party Band Saved Heavy Metal. Thanks, Michael. Uh, stay frosty. Oh, stay frosty, Bye. friend. You too can leave me an audio comment or book review. Area code 706-621-ROCK. Or you can do, that's area code 706-621-7625. Or you can send me an MP3 to rockandrollgeek at gmail.com like Eric the Rock and Roll Plebe did. Speaking of Van Halen, uh, on Eddie Van Halen's birthday, Sammy Hager tweeted, Happy birthday, Eddie. I hope you're doing good. And to many fans' surprise, Eddie responded, writing, Thanks, Sammy. Hope you're well, too. How about that? That's big news on the blabbermouth, friends. Happy birthday, Eddie. Thanks, man. I hope you're well, too. Super great. Could not be better. All right. So does that mean there's going to be a Van, uh, Van Hagar reunion? I would not... I would not... Um, I would not discount that idea it sounds like something that eddie van halen would probably be thinking about but at least they're talking on the twitter so good for them all right okay an email to read from my friend jim rim he sends me these um mixtapes of the month every month i get a mixtape from jim rim the last one had a Motorhead, MC5, Four Horsemen, The Damned, Manic Street Preachers, Michael Monroe, a bunch of, there's like 25 songs he puts on these um, CDs. Anyway, he's a listener of the Rock and Roll Geek Show, I think. He sent me an email. He says, hey, Michael, I have a question about an American Heartbreak song. A while back, I was going to ask you about this song when I assumed it was you who wrote it. Because I had a, take a, a hand in writing a lot of the American Heartbreak songs. And he says, I originally thought it was you writing about your relationship with your wife, which you had chronicled to some degree on the show. I was going to ask you how sticky the situation was when she heard it and how you deal with that sort of thing and blah, blah, blah. And all that personal Michael Butler type interview questions kind of thing. Ouch. I get it. All right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then I got lazy and never sent the email off. Anyway, sometime later, you were talking about the album and how the band was fighting at the time and songs were written about each other and whatnot. I found that rather interesting. And later, while listening to Bits, something clicked. You said that that song was written about you by another band member. Right after the first intro verse, there's the Ah, which had previously taken which I had previously taken as a cool little throw-in akin to shalala or doo-wop, doo-wop kind of thing. But in retrospect, I take this as a parody of the rock and roll geek taking a sip of his fine Tecate. Hint, I'm going to take a sip of his fine Tecate. Ah! Which I had previously... Okay, um, he says, but in retrospect, I think I, I take it... In retrospect... Wait a second. In retrospect, I take... I can't read, friends. 
In retrospect, I take this as a parody of the rock and roll geek taking a sip of fine Tecate. Am I imagining that, or is that the way you see it too? And was that something you see you saw right away, or did you hit it later? Like it did, or did it hit you later? Like it did me, or maybe I'm just wrong. Anyway, these are always fun little stories for me. Songs that have little hidden hidden meanings and secrets in them, or you actually know the person the song is written about. Anyway, if you could expound a little bit more on who wrote that and um, and who was it about, and clear things up for me on the ah in bitch. Take care, Jim Rim. All right, I will. Clear that up, Jim Rim. Uh, Bitch was written by Casey Crenshaw. And during the time when we were writing that American Heartbreak album, I almost quit the band several times because I wanted to stay more true to the postcard. Pardon me, I'm Burma, it's fine. God, I wanted to stay true to the uh, style of music we were playing in Postcards from Hell, more of the glam punk. And... Other guys in the band wanted to be more like a later day Goo Goo Dolls and Bon Jovi, which I was dead against. I like early Goo Goo Dolls, but I don't like later day Goo Goo Dolls, and I definitely don't like Bon Jovi. So we, it, during the writing of that album, some a lot of the songs are about other guys on the in the band. It's kind of like our Fleetwood Mac rumors. Uh, there was a song called Somebody, which was about was written by me by about some guys in the band and there were some other songs as well but Casey wrote that one about me because I was bitching all the time about the direction our music was going and I made some demands I said if we on our live shows if we need we need to play at least four songs from this record four songs from this and I said I wanted to draw to play songs from all stages of our of our quote career and so I said if we don't do this I'm going to quit the band and I kind of held them over a barrel which was kind of immature but that's what I did because I wanted to stay true to our rock and roll and I didn't want to be a sappy pop I just didn't want to be a sap I just didn't want to sound like a crappy watered down bullshit band so I fought Hard to keep the integrity of American Heartbreak. That I might have done it the wrong way, but I that's what I did. So Casey wrote that song about me. All right. And there was one song in there, uh, one line in there called Tell Me Why, which is kind of the hook of the song. I wrote the melody for Tell Me Tell Me Why. I wrote that, but the rest of the lyrics and all were written by Casey Crenshaw. All right. So here's for you. I'm gonna for Jim Rim, I'm gonna play bitch. And in the ah, the ah. At the beginning, it is more of a take. It's not the fine Tecate. It is, um, it is a takeoff on an Aerosmith song, which I think it's either You See Me Crying or Home Tonight. It's one of those ballads because Steven Tyler goes, ah, and that's where Lance got that from. So here's Bitch from American Heartbreak for Jim Rim. So you got some bitch in a two. It's nothing new With you, now I'm fucking through
American Heartbreak. <laughs> All right, another audio comment from, I don't know who this is from. Hi, Michael. It's Billy the Sea. Oh, hey, Billy. Hope you remember me. I do. It's been a long time since I've called or left you a message. So I thought I'd just record this one and email it to you. I appreciate it. I hadn't listened to the program in a really long time. And this past week, I downloaded a bunch of episodes and sat in my bed and listened to them one night this week. And I got to tell you, I really enjoyed it. I know this sounds like a thank God ass kissing, but thank God. I appreciate it, friend. I thought I was losing it. A lot of years. And. Every time I do listen to it, I remember why you've done this so long. There you go. It's one of the only, Thank you, if man. not really the only podcast I've ever listened to that I can just sit down, listen to it, and really feel like I'm right in the room with you, talking you are. with you. That's you what are, makes friend. it successful. I just wish more people knew about it. Ah, I don't care. I really don't yeah, care, friend. Do too. But a couple of things I wanted to say and the reason i called okay. was number one i really enjoyed your 2015 top 10 list of best records of the year thought it was really good spot on thanks you know i don't agree with every single one of them but i agree with probably 90 percent of it so i mean can't can't get it all right um like i don't really get it that iron maiden's number one maybe well, I should sit down okay. and listen to it. Yes, Be honest, I didn't should. even listen to it. There you go. I just have a thing against that kind of music. Eh. I've never been like a 80s heavy metal guy, you know? Me neither. Me neither, friend. That's why I was surprised that New Iron Maiden would have been my favorite album of the year, but I gave them credit where credit was due. I've always been more of a blues, I guess what you call a blues purist, but that's where rock and roll came from, you know? Um... You know, the greatest rock band I still think ever is the Rolling Stones, not the Beatles. When I was young, grr, I think <laughs> I thought the Beatles were the greatest. But when okay. I started to realize over the years where the Stones came from, you know, how they took the blues and just wanted to be a blues band originally and then became this rock band that was unbelievably different than anything else. <sighs> There's just nothing better, I don't think. Well, I had Keith and Richards in there. I think all my music that I loved over the years, rock and roll, has been somehow traced back to that. That's why I don't get the Anthrax, Metallica, you know. I guess I, I put Iron Maiden in that category. Maybe I shouldn't. But, uh, you know, those guys don't have that, that roots, man. I disagree. You know, I, I think know you they do. I talked about Guns N' Roses in one of these episodes I listened to this week, and 
how they didn't ever really impress you, but, you know, they came from that Roots thing, too. Not my favorite band, either, but <clears throat> I think they understood it. What's, you know, I always go back to this thing when I talk about music with my friends, about the real deal, you know. I feel really lucky to have grown up in the years I grew up with music. You know, in the 70s, I was in my, you know, 20s, so that was prime time, right? And I don't think there was any better rock music ever made than in the 70s. Exactly, and, you know, exactly. Maybe I'm old and grungy now and don't really think that, you know, there's a lot of great new bands. But, you know, you prove that with your list. The Biters is a great example. Are they Black Crows? No, but it's close. And it's also really inspiring to see that young people are still taking the roots and playing rock music. And that's where the biters come from, Michael, is they come from that blues thing. I don't have to tell you that. But, you know, I guess that's the one thing I never really understood. Only plays our tastes and music kind of goes opposite You're directions. You're wrong. You're I just wrong, never friends. Liked that. You know, you're wrong. Music I just got done telling you about. You are wrong because I like that kind of music as well. I oh. like a good song. A good song is a good song, whether it's uh, whether it's from Iron Maiden or from Keith Richards. And also, when I was going to record this, um, do you remember the time I sent that tirade uh, into Good <laughs> Clean Fun about four or five years ago? Yes. Probably three or four years ago anyways. You were pissed at um, Jasper. Because Jasper pissed me off so bad. <laughs> yeah, you know, you Jasper go. comes from the same town that I do. <laughs> You know, which is outside of Detroit, Michigan. I, um, I, I come from Royal Oak, Michigan. Yeah, okay. I don't know if that's exactly where. Don't came drink from, the water, from what I hear. He came from this area, you know, and he just used to fucking drive me crazy with his opinionated <laughs> shit on music. And yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember I I sent you this twenty minute tirade about him, and you played it. Yep. And I know it hurt his feelings. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, he, I kind of felt bad after well, he played it. I think I even apologized to him. He probably uh, did not really accept your apology on, on either, that, did he? Really off and running on that uh, message. I hope you remember it. I think it was pretty funny now that I yeah. think back on I it. I think I'm so, too. I'm sure he didn't really give a shit about <laughs> me anyway. So what did he care what I have to say? <laughs> you know, just like, what does anybody care what somebody has to say? It's just an opinion. That's right. So I just wanted to tell you, I'm sorry for the long message here, but I just wanted to tell you that I thought the the uh, list was great. I totally agreed with you on the Night Flight Orchestra. I think that was just horrible. I think everybody... And I really enjoyed I think your... everybody to a T agreed with me. Not one person said Night Flight Orchestra was good, except for Joey Rock and Roll. Track, I don't think I've laughed that hard in a long time. So that's about it, I guess. Okay. I I, uh, I basically wanted to call and tell you how much I really uh, enjoy your show. Well, thank you, friend. That means a lot. Enjoy, me. you know, listening to it when I don't have a lot of good things going on in my life. Yeah, it kind of brings me up. If man. you don't have any good things going in your life, listen to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. It'll bring you up, friends. It's supposed to be about right. That's Just right. Like That's music exactly is right. supposed to be, that, exactly, be the same friend. thing. Exactly. And you do that with your podcast. Man. Thanks, man. So thanks, Michael. Thank you. You have a great day, great night, great life. Billy the Sea out. Billy the Sea signing off. Stay frosty, Billy the Sea. I really appreciate the call, friend. Oh, yeah. I forgot. I almost forgot about this. Do you remember the. Um, I don't know if you've been on the Facebook and all, but uh, there was a a um, tribute to Dimebag Daryl in L.A. And um, Phil Anselmo, uh, Gary Holt, uh, on stage, a bunch of, bunch of guys, Gary Holt, the guy from the Foo Fighters, Rob Flynn from Machine Head, all got on stage, Phil Anselmo, and they played, um, they did a tribute to Dimebag Daryl. They played a um, bunch of Pantera songs. And at the end of the set, or whatever, uh, Phil Anselmo did the uh, Nazi salute and said, white power. And the guy from Machine Head got, made this uh, video ranting about how, how um, I don't know what the, that sound is, but 
how Phil Anselmo was a racist and blah, blah, blah. And all these people got up in arms about Phil Anselmo, about being a racist. And uh, this band All Shall Perish made a big thing. Who I don't even know who All Shall Perish. All these bands jumped on the bandwagon about how they so pissed off about Pantera. And they're, they're, it's a black mark on metal and how it just can't be tolerated and all this and that. All these people were huge Pantera fans. All these people, the biggest Pantera fans, they thought they were the gods of metal and they were so taken aback by what Phil Anselmo did. And I'm thinking to myself, well, let me, who, who all did this? Uh, all Shall Perish did a big long thing slamming Phil Anselmo for his racist behavior. Uh, Darkest Hour, uh, Machine Head, the drummer, the ex-drummer from Machine Head, and um, all these people just did this big tirade against Phil Anselmo, and I think he he even did a, an apology. Can I find the apology? Let's see, if I can find it. He tried. He begged everybody for his for the forgiveness. Let me see if I can find it here. I don't know how long this is because I have not heard it. Phil B. Anselmo here, and I'm here to res basically respond to all the heat I've been getting that I deserve completely. Um, I was at the Dime Bash, and it was extremely late at night. Uh, there was heavy-duty talk between myself and, and those who love Dime, and, and uh, heavy emotions were flowing. Jokes were made backstage that transpired upon the stage and it was ugly, it was uncalled for, and anyone who knows me and my true nature knows that I don't believe in any of that. I don't want to be part of any group. I just, I'm an individual and, and, I'm, and I am a thousand percent apologetic to anyone that took offense to what I said because you should have taken offense to what I said. And I am so sorry. And I hope you just, man, give me another chance to, <laughs> just give me another chance. I love all of you. And anyone who's met me, anyone who knows me knows that I love all of you. Bless you. Well, there you go. Anyway, nobody accepted his apology. They think he should be banned from metal. All these people were a huge <clears throat> Pantera fans, which I can I can say that I'm not a huge Pantera fan. Never really was. Uh, but I just assumed that Phil and Selma was a racist. I mean, the guy's a skinhead. He's done that Nazi salute before, hasn't he? And I think I've heard him say white power before. And I, I will probably take a wild guess and say Dimebag was probably racist too. Come on, all the dudes are from Texas. Come on, man. Anyway, my point is all these people worship Pantera and got on Facebook and changed their icons and ranted about how now they hate Pantera. Stand behind it, friends. Burn your fucking Pantera records. If you're really that upset, Stop listening to Pantera, burn your records, and boycott them, not just changing your Facebook icons, okay? There you go. I came out and said it for what that's worth. All right, enough of that. Do I take it seriously? No. Everybody, just get along and why, just be nice to each other. Just don't be assholes and tear everybody down because they do something that's stupid. Of course what he did was stupid. It's idiotic. But it, does it surprise you? No, it doesn't surprise me in the very least. Does Rob Flynn need to get up and, and do a 15-minute video saying how he, he's angry about it and pissed off? It's within his right. Sure, he can do it. But do we have to all watch it? No, I don't want to watch it. Do I care about a band named All Shall Perish with their big, long tirade? Who the hell are All Shall Perish? All these bands are jumping on the bandwagon to try to get names for themselves, piling on a guy who was drunk doing racist goofball shit. Just get along, friends. There's, my, there's your Michael Butler rant of the evening. All right. Speaking of Michael Butler rants, uh, have you heard the new Steven Tyler country song? Let's listen to a little bit of it. All right. Oh, well, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, 
nothing else matters You and me and the Georgia Nays Look around cause it don't get any better Have you ever felt so alright? Let's dance, dance I'm gonna take it to the chorus, okay? Don't, don't worry, I'm not gonna play the whole song When we're singing about American girls like you When I look in your eyes All I wanna do is Baby, baby, baby like a 4th of July There you go. New new Steven Tyler. Not bad. I mean, if you for what it is, it sounds as good as don't want to miss a thing. It sounds like every other country song that is on country radio right now, which I'm not Martina listens to it all the time and I I listen to it sometimes as well. And but this sounds exactly like all of those songs. But all of those songs sound exactly to me like don't want to miss a thing. And um you're my angel. So there you go. That's the new Steven Tyler. The Re- reason I'm playing that because I'm going to play something that I think is a little bit better of country music. This is Stacy Collins. Here you go. Friends. That is a really good album. 
Stacy Collins roll the dice. I like it more every time I listen to it. That is how country music should be to me. Nothing gets a new Steven Tyler. It's catchy enough, but I think that song's a little bit better. All right, one more thing before we wrap this thing up. Uh, the Cause of Death released for Jimmy Bain. I, mean, I don't know if you know who Jimmy Bain is. He played with Dio and he played with. Um, he was in a version of Deep Purple, I think. I really like Jimmy Bain a lot. He was one of my favorite bass players, actually. American Heartbreak played with. Uh, we we played at the San Bernardino uh, Superdome, or whatever whatever that outdoor venue is in San Bernardino. It's like a you know an outdoor arena. And it was Scorpions, the lineup was Scorpions, uh, Deep Purple, and Dio. And between bands, American Heartbreak played on the side stage. It was one side stage, and we went on after Dio, and then after Deep Purple. So we, we played two sets. So when everybody went out to get their beers, they would come out and they would see American Heartbreak playing where the beer was. It was a very fun show, and Jimmy Bain was playing with Ronnie James Dio, and I just remember he he wore he had some red sneakers on, red high top Converse's, uh, black leather pants, and a t shirt, and he looked really cool. And I always liked Jimmy Bain. Um, and then later on, when I was in Jet Boy, we played with Rhino Bucket, and Jimmy Jimmy Bain showed up to the Rhino Bucket show when Jet Boy was opening because Simon <coughs> Simon Wright was playing drums for Rhino Bucket at the time. And he came to see his friend Simon Wright because uh, they were in Dio together. Am I right about that? I think so. And Jimmy Bain did not look good then. That was probably a good, what, 15 years ago or so? But I always remember liking Jimmy Bain a lot. He's one of, my, one of the bass players that I really like. I'm not a, I don't really follow that many bass players except for Pete Way, Didi Ramone, and Steve Harris, and the guy from DAD, uh, Stig Peterson. But Jimmy Bain's one of those bass players that I liked a lot. I always thought he looked cool on stage. He was a good bass player. But his cause of death was ruled as lung cancer. He died on the Def Leppard hysteria on the high seas cruise which was i mean i guess if you're gonna die die with your boots on as as iron maiden says but uh rest in peace jimmy bain cause of death ruled as lung cancer all right i think i'm gonna wrap up the show tonight i think uh that's a bad way to wrap it up with on a bummer note but Friends, we'll talk to you later. Um, another, I'm not sure if we're doing a Mad at Dad on Monday, and if we don't do a Mad at Dad, I will do the track-by-track track of the New Whitford St. Holmes on next Monday. I have a gig on Friday with the Butlers. Saturday, I'm going I'm, uh, going to go see um, a friend of the show, Chris Capel, the rock and roll copywriter, just now sent me a text and asked if I wanted to, free, wanted to be his guest at the Metallica show, which is right the day before the Super Bowl. And I couldn't really say no, could I, to my, to a friend of the show offering me to take me to see Metallica. So I'm going to do that on Saturday night. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris Capel, for offering. I really appreciate it, friend. All right. Let's wrap it up with one more song. I got an email. Oh, no, I got a phone call today from Frank Domino's manager, a guy named Peter Kalish. I don't know if I should have said his name. His name's Peter. Okay. He asked me if I'd be interested in um, interviewing Frank Domino from Angel. And I said, are you kidding? I would love to. Well, he sent me the, the latest Frank Domino album, which I have not listened to in its entirety. I've only heard like a couple of songs. So he sent it to me. So I'm going to close out with a new Frank, with a Frank Domino song. I guess it's not new at this point. It, but it, kind of. It's on his latest album. The album is called Old Habits Die Hard, and he's calling it just Domino. But it's Frank Domino's solo album. Punky Meadows plays on one song. I don't know who plays on this one, but I just grabbed one out of the hat. This song is called The Rain's About to Fall. Before I do, let me tell you how you can reach me. Rockandrollgeek at gmail.com. Area code 706-621-ROCK. That's area code 706-621-7625. Uh, send me an audio comment or an MP3 to that number. Find me on the Facebook r and Geek. Find me on the Twitter r and Geek. Find me on the Instagram Rock and Roll Geek. Don't ask. And find this show at rockandrollgeek.com. Don't forget Mad at Dad podcast slash death pool if you want to take part in, in our tasteless musician's death pool. Everybody dying. Jimmy Bain died. Um, 
Uh, the guy from Jefferson Starship, Paul Kantner died. They're all dying, friends. So if you want to get in on f- predicting who's going to die next, sign up at Mattadad Podcast slash Deathpool and ask for an invite. We've got about 25 people there now, and we would love to have you on as well. All right. Anything else about anything else to say? Oh, yeah. Thank you for the donations, friends. Without your donations, this show would die a horrible, putrid, stench-filled death. We'll talk to you next week. Here is brand new Frank Domino. The song is called The Rain's About to Fall. It's a rock and roll geek train wreck.